Into the wild I'll go and into the wild I am It's been a while, freedom child, since I left my roots back home Into the wild I'll go and into the wild I am It's been a while, freedom child, since I left my roots back home Welcome to the Free Birth Society podcast This is a radical space for women who are ready to celebrate their autonomous choices in birth, motherhood, and beyond. Together, we'll learn about wild birth through personal narrative, we'll explore the politics of birth, and we'll analyze everything that relates to our lives as women from a feminist perspective. Here's your host, Emily Saldana. It's been a while, freedom Imagine a land where women and girls run wild and free, where we're supported to feel, encouraged to express, and where we experience true collective healing. A place where we can play, laugh, and howl under the moon. Here, you can let your guard down and come back to the essence of wild womanhood, your nervous system finally able to relax in the total absence of men and the total presence of sisterhood. Women call this the magic place. And as female-only spaces continue to dwindle, securing land of my own for women's festivals has been a lifelong dream come to fruition. So I'm thrilled to announce and invite you to the second annual Matriarch Rising Festival that will take place here in the Blue Ridge Mountains of North Carolina, June 19th through the 24th. This is an exclusive Wild Women's Summer Solstice Gathering. A week of dancing, nude sunbathing, communing with the elements, singing, and falling in love with what it means to be alive as a woman. Tickets are officially on sale and they will sell out, so head over to matriarchrisingfestival.com for all the details and to get your ticket. Can't wait to see you there. This week, I'm talking with Anna from Sweden. As an RH negative, first time mom, Anna was swept up in the fear mongering and control of the hospital system. And despite what she determined at the time was a natural hospital birth, she entered motherhood feeling alone. As she started questioning everything that had happened to her during her birth, she finds free birth. And with her second daughter, Anna went from questioning to knowing as she brought her into the world, surrounded by family and love. Okay, so yeah, kick us okay. off. Cool. Tell us, tell us, start your story wherever you want to begin. Yeah, so I have two daughters, Isla and Riley, and Isla is born in 2015. So it was before I, before the podcast, and I had, I hadn't heard of free birth before then. I wanted a home birth, and in Sweden, which is where I live, to have a home birth midwife. It cost 40,000 kroner, which is I'm not sure how many, how much that is in dollars. But I, at the time, I wasn't prepared to pay that amount when the alternative is free. And now that I know <laughs> better, it, I would just be inviting the um, medical midwife into, I'd be inviting the medical system into my home. Totally. When you yeah. say the alternative is free, you mean the hospital, yeah. right? Yes. Yeah. Okay. So 40,000 <laughs> krona yeah. to USD US. is 4,600. 4,600. Yeah. Yeah. So that's, that's like a little bit less than what it is in America. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Like I said, and that's with your first born. The second oh, right. Sweden does a weird thing with this. Yeah. yeah. Will you explain that? Okay. So with your firstborn, you, um, if you employ a medical midwife, uh, then you pay the, the 40,000 or I think they've actually, it's, it's not 40,000 anymore, but at the time in 2015, it was, uh, and, but with your, uh, consequent children, it's free. <laughs> That's very strange. Yeah. So the healthcare system pays for the medical midwives from your second baby on. Yes. 
That's very strange. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I didn't know that till I think last year, so- somewhat recently. It's probably what- me that told you. <laughs> <laughs> so what's the reasoning there? Like you just have to prove that you're so you what know you what had, you're doing. Yeah, yeah. What if you had a baby in the hospital with your first, then is the medical midwife at home free with your second? Yes. So you just need to pop a baby out. Yeah. <laughs> that is very strange. I, know. I mean, you know, on that note, I know medical midwives who will only attend second time births. Yeah. Okay. Like first time moms, they're like, nope, not available. Oh, no. So, yeah, for so me, basically the same. Yeah. Uh, for me, I would definitely um, uh, attend uh, or support a woman having her first baby. I, uh, and also, I wanted a water birth. Uh, I, well, I thought I wanted a water birth. You never know when you get there, dear. Uh, that also wasn't allowed at the time in 2015. I thought that I had to go to all my prenatal appointments. I thought that you had to do that. Mm-hmm. Totally. Yeah. So, and I found it so stressful. I was running down there, you know, they, they have like a, a schedule and I went to every single one, every single prenatal appointment and it was so stressful. I had to take time off work to mm. go down there and yeah. And you never know how long it's going to take. So anyway, I went to all of those and at my last, and I did ultrasounds. I did three ultrasounds in total. Of course. No, yeah. no, I know. <laughs> and at my last prenatal visit with the midwife she said I was measuring too small and she sent me for an ultrasound or she put me in for an ultrasound and uh, on the morning of that ultrasound I could feel that uh, I could feel sensations coming on mm. um, and I thought well there's no point in me going for this ultrasound if this is the birth process starting so I phoned and I said there's no point in me coming surely and they said no you should come anyway and just to be clear, you did not pay the 40,000 krona for a home birth midwife, right? No. I, yeah. uh, like I said, I wasn't prepared to pay that at the time. Totally. So yeah. you, you're, in, you're in the hospital system. You wanted mm-hmm. the home birth. You wanted the water birth. But because you just didn't know all the options yet, yeah. you go with the hospital. Yes. So it, it's, it must be so, I know that so many women deal with this, but that just sounds so depressing. <laughs> yeah. You know, like in this exciting time and your yeah. body's changing and you're feeling this, you know, little alien come into your womb and like everything is so magical. Mm-hmm. It just, then it's like paired with what I'm projecting is like, yeah, like depressing to yeah. like go into the place that you don't really want to be. And no, yeah. no. and even the prenatal appointments, it's, mm-hmm. you meet the same midwife every single time. So, you know, it's familiar, but it's still oh, so stressful. And every, you know, oh, we'll you take a blood sample and we do this, do this. Oh, I forgot to say that I'm RH negative. Um, so I did, oh, uh, the anti-D. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, I wouldn't do that today, knowing what I know now. Yeah. And also, so two days prior to um, uh, these sensations starting, um, I woke up and I had felt, I felt a little bit wet in bed and I wasn't sure are these, my water's releasing or how did I just pee the bed? I don't know. (laughs) And they were very, very clear that if you think that your waters are broken, you need to phone the hospital straight away. So, and they kept drumming that in and it just made you feel like, wow, so this is really, really important. (laughs) So I phoned, uh, anyway, so that is in my records. Two days prior, something happened that she thinks it's the waters releasing. That's in my record, just to be clear now. My appointment was for 11 a.m. And by then my, I had taken, I was, had taken the dog for a walk with my sensations and I had to stop every now and then like breathe through them and like people were looking at me like what's she doing (laughs) and I got home and my husband came to pick me up and we did bring a bag just in case and got and the the car journey was horrendous like you just want to move around and now you're stuck in a car sitting down and we get there and the room is full, the waiting room for the ultrasound is full of couples there for their first ultrasound. And I'm standing there in front of all these people. Oh my God. 
Yeah, and that was horrendous. Yeah, uh, totally. yeah, it, and it just I just felt all the eyes on me, like, what is she doing here? She's in the wrong room, totally. <laughs> yeah, wrong part of the hospital. And of course, I was the last one to go in. Everyone came and went, and so I just, the whole time they're all staring at me, and I'm just trying to like ignore them all. <laughs> and then I come in for the ultrasound, and. She's like, wow, so things are actually happening. We'll just do this ultrasound. And if you want, I can check you and see how far along you are. Now I know that sort of doesn't matter. <laughs> but I was like, okay, that's, that's cool. Yeah, so we did the ultrasound and she said, yeah, your baby's quite small and you're four centimeters open, dilated. So you can just go straight up to the label ward. How, how worried were you about the two small comments? Oh, um, not at all, really. Okay. I, yeah. It was just words to me at the time. It, it didn't matter. It didn't mean anything. And I think she thought that by saying, oh, the baby's small, then I actually had peace of mind because I thought, oh, well, this will be easy, an easy birth, you know, <laughs> or something like that. It felt to me like that's what she thought. Yeah. yeah. Anyway, I, I don't know. That's just a story I've made up, but it, that's what it felt to me at the time. Yes. Yeah, so then... We went up to the labor ward and by then I was quite uncomfortable. I'd been standing in front of all these people and we get to the reception and the woman is just so rude and, and like, you need to calm down. Like, ah, oh, okay. <laughs> and then they show me into a room and they leave us there for quite a long time. And they tell me to get up on the, the, the bed and and I don't want to lie down I want to be moving around and I'm in there for a long time so I'm very very uncomfortable and in the end they come in and they check me and then they take me through to another room where a midwife who has checked my chart sees that I think that my waters are broken that's right no no they didn't check me that's right she just assumes that my water waters have released and she starts sticking an IV in my arm uh, with antibiotics. And um, like, what? sorry, what's happening? And she's like, well, you know, your waters have broken and need to have antibiotics. It was two days ago. Uh, and at the time, I believed her. I believed that to be true. So I'm like, okay. I don't really don't want to subject myself and my child to antibiotic. If you're saying that that's what I need, then okay. <laughs> And you know, I don't go to the to the hospital or a doctor. I don't see medical. But for some reason, and I think a lot of women think this, that um, when it comes to childbirth, then you know that goes out the window. And and I this is why I think it's so important that I have come on the podcast to let people know that you know it it, it, it doesn't. It's not important. You know, it, you're the authority. Yeah, so she then goes off her shift and two new, a, a midwife and a nurse come in and they're there for the entire birth process, which was very nice. And they came on when it started and then their shift ended at the end. They haven't seen anything about, they don't know why I have an IV. So I told them that I didn't want any pain relief. And, and they looked at me like incredulous and later told me on after the birth that they had gone and spoken to their colleagues and said, and they'd laughed and said, ha ha, we have a first time mum thinking that she's going to give birth without pain relief. And they had all laughed and they told me this after. Yeah. I mean, and from where they sit, that is, that is almost unheard of. This was strange to me at the time, but now I know better. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Totally. <laughs> yeah, really strange to me at the time. Anyway, so I came in with like my music system and I had my music playing and they thought that was really lovely. They were they were pretty hands off, actually. I think they thought it was going to take longer and mm -hmm. then they left me to it. Totally. Yeah. So I'm, I'm lucky in that in that respect. So I remember it during this birth that I was totally in that zone. You know, I was where you know that place where women go at, when they're in the birth process and I remember them disturbing me I remember being pulled out of it I just uh and them asking questions and they thought I was they were like what's wrong with her 
what, what she's in some sort of psychosis <laughs> yeah I, I, and I heard this I was in there but I could hear their questions and they kept pulling me out and then you know after a few hours I my body just took over and need and pushed needed to push and the midwife was like are you are you pushing and I was like yeah I think I'm pushing and she was like oh okay um I, I felt like I needed to poo and she was, they gave me this stool to sit on and and then they also asked me the, no they didn't ask me they said you need to empty your bladder before the baby comes would you like to try yourself or would you like a catheter and I was like I would like to try myself please <laughs> and you know with everyone watching nothing came so they they're just thinking <laughs> then by the time I'm pushing they're like oh right you need to get on the bed now so I'm scrambling up on this bed and by the time I'm up there I'm so exhausted that I just have to lie back and that is how I gave birth and to their in their defense or, or to their credit they were actually encouraging me they said would you like let's try another position which is also coaching as well you know I might have wanted to be on my back but I uh, I, I couldn't physically uh, try anything else because I was so so exhausted and you know that then you know this was so six hours later she was born and the midwife said oh feel touch reach down and you can feel the hair coming and I could feel this sort of big head of hair and that was amazing but it's also you know a, a midwife telling you to feel you know it's not you deciding you want to feel down there also just as the head was or her head was about to emerge and I was totally aware, unaware of this but the midwife had pressed like the alarm button because the fetal monitor had um, come off so all these people rushed into the room and but she was like out and, she, and they were like, oh, it's just the fetal monitors has come off. <laughs> I was walking around telling people that I had a, had a natural birth. Mm -hmm. I was uh, uh, like, just being in the hospitals unnatural. But yeah, so I was like, I had a natural birth, no, no epidural, no induction, no um, gas and air. Um, but I had antibiotics in my arm. <laughs> um, yeah, so any, oh, I, I forgot to say that just before uh, her head came out, my waters released. So that wasn't, obviously wasn't my waters. Um, and she was like, oh, those are your waters. Did you feel that? And I was like, yeah, of course I felt that. Um, and she was like, well, why did they stick any IV in you? So she was like, well, wh why did they do that? Just yeah, to be no safe. Yes, I know. <laughs> So safe. And then oh, she told me that uh, the midwife had told me that I had torn and uh, she was like just stuck a, a, an uh, anesthesia in or oh, whatever it's called. Yeah. And the, to do the stitches. Yes. A lidocaine. Yeah. Yeah. So at the time I was like, yes, this was totally natural. I loved it. Absolutely loved it. And even when I went to see the midwife who I did my prenatal care with and she asked me, and I did tell her, well, I had antibiotics, which I were completely unnecessary and other things and that, that didn't feel right. And she then I was like, well, that was what was necessary. You know, of course, <laughs> she says that. And my postpartum, I was very stoic. I didn't have a support group. Um, I didn't know that I needed one. Um, I would take the dog out. For walks and it was February it was freezing cold I got plug ducks I would just try, cry through the whole walk or try to hold back tears and I didn't have any family my mum has moved here now but she wasn't living here at the time and I didn't have any of that in place so yeah and obviously I didn't know that I needed that so that's my my thing I tell all women right and postpartum. I mean, for postpartum to feel hard like that is so normalized yeah it's just like oh this is just how it is like i'm yep. lonely and i'm struggling and and this is just how it is i spend long days alone with the baby and mm -hmm. it's just all kind of on me and this is yeah. just motherhood is hard that know. is why it was hard because i told myself it was hard as well mm -hmm. yeah and my, as soon as my husband would come home from work i would hand her over 
like, oh, you know, I, I bitch about uh, technology and Instagram and social media and everything. But it was a woman on Instagram and she had had her baby out in the woods. And I was like, wow, I want to have my baby in the woods. <laughs> you can do that. Yeah. OK. And then because I had this experience and we didn't have that special bonding because of her birth and everything. I took a, a conscious motherhood course and she had also had two free births at the time. She's had three now, three free No way. Births. Yeah. So then I was like, oh, a free birth. What is that? And then I discovered the podcast. Yes. Yeah, so and then I realized, I realized that my birth was just so unnatural. Mm. <laughs> yeah. And I was like, well, you know, I could have just done this myself. Uh, and I think it's so important because you can do it yourself as a first time mom absolutely well um, and it's it's not even like you can it's that you will if yes. if you don't if you don't hand it over if you don't leave your home if you don't go get surgery if you don't actively choose otherwise the end result guaranteed is going to be you birth your baby because it is definitely definitely coming out and so yes. I think that's kind of an interesting distinction to make. It's not you can, it's literally that you will. It yeah, is yeah. impending destiny, you know, yeah. it's going to happen yeah. unless you. Yes, intervene. thank you for pulling me up on that. <laughs> yeah, and I, I mean, I didn't find Isla's birth traumatic at all, mm -hmm. but now I, you know, when I started listening to these women's stories and like, yeah, that didn't need to happen didn't need to happen and you know that could have just gone so much easier and without interventions at home. I had two losses in between Isla and Riley um, and that just I just let them release naturally and the, the thing that was upsetting mostly was that the second time we had told Isla that she was going to be a big sister and it, they were very early. There were six weeks, both of them. So then Riley, yeah, the wild, feral one. <laughs> so did um, you know pre-pregnancy that that mm -hmm. was how you were going to do it? Yes, definitely. So how yeah. did that go with your husband and your mom and like the people mm -hmm. that matter to you? If you entered into the pregnancy knowing what you mm -hmm. wanted it to look like? Yeah. Was um, he down? Yes, uh, I think he was a bit like cautious at first, but then he kind of just knows that I'll do it anyway. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and mom, she just, uh, she trusts me. She, yeah. So um, it wasn't a big deal? No, not with nice. my immediate family, not my mm -hmm. sister and my dad. My husband's family, I uh, was a little bit, oh, we didn't really maybe tell them exactly how things were going to go down. Um, they're very into the medical system. Um, some of them, uh, not so much, but um, yeah. And, and I, I, I had a wild pregnancy, so <laughs> I, I did tell some people, but I was very, very, I, I kept, kept it to my chest. I didn't tell everybody because I did tell mom one mother and she was like, aren't you afraid the baby's going to get stuck? I like, no. <laughs> I didn't feel any fear during, during, you know, the, the weeks prior to. I did feel some, because I'd had those two pregnancy losses, they were still in there in my head. So I, with Isla, when I was pregnant with her, I would do stuff. I would like jump off jetties into the lake. And, and with this, I was like, mm, I, mean, I don't think I should do that. Like when the water's 14 degrees and <laughs> um, Celsius. But uh, yeah, so wild pregnancy, apart from I went to the, the same midwife one time when I was 32 weeks pregnant, just for proof of pregnancy. And she was very surprised to see me that far along. Did you um, tell her the truth or how did you kind of navigate that? No, <laughs> I was like, she said, um, okay, well, we'll book you in for the next appointment. And I was like, no, I don't think I want to come back. And she was like, oh, well, can I ask why? And I said, oh, I just don't think I need it. And that was it, that was okay for her. So, yeah. <laughs> okay, sweet. I didn't go into details and I didn't yeah. try to cool. tell her. Her it's job. called going rogue. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. Cool. So anyway, on the uh, the day of her birth, 
me and Isla were just hanging out. It was a really, really nice day. And it was at the end of May. And by then I had gone 10 days over. <laughs> and in Sweden, if you're in the medical system, if, you, if you're past 41 weeks, then they induce you. And my mum phoned me and she asked me what we were doing. And I was like, well, just hanging out. And she was like, why isn't she inviting me around? She felt she knew there was something, something was going to happen. And then she kind of invited herself. She's like, can I come around? And I said, yeah, go for it. So we hung out, hung out and uh, Isla was singing songs and she was making us laugh. And we just had such a wonderful day. Aww. Yeah. That sounds so nice. Yeah, it was. And I was feeling kind of crampy, uh, but, you know, nothing like big. Uh, we had dinner and then I put Isla to bed and I would just fall asleep next to her every single night at the, at the end of that pregnancy. It was, I was tired. Um, and I woke up at half past nine in the evening when my husband went to bed. So he must have kind of woken me up um, by going to bed. And I woke up and I was like, wow, something's actually happening. And I don't think I can lie down anymore. So I went up and I, for some reason, I was like, oh, well, I'll time these contractions, birth sensations. And I was like, three minutes, that can't be right. You don't know what you're doing, Anna. <laughs> I was like, oh well but if this is the start of the birth I will go back to bed because I might need I'll need my energy and I went and lay down I was like no I can't lie down anymore so um, we had a room and it, we called it the yoga room and I had prepared I had a birth altar I had take I took all the pots off the windowsill and I turned the fairy lights on and I lit candles mm. on my birth altar but by this, and I uh, pulled down the curtains, like just prepared and it was dark and it was quiet. And, um, but by that point, I, I, I couldn't put the music on. And that was very important for me in my first birth because it was kind of like a little piece of home in the hospital. But by the, I didn't have music anyway. So I was just hanging out there on the Pilates ball, just kind of leaning on it probably for about 45 minutes an hour <clears throat> and then I felt like I really want to have a bath that would be really relaxing and I went to the bathroom and I tried to fill the bath oh god no I can't do it <laughs> so I went and I woke my husband up and it's the middle of the night and I'm like can you pour me a bath and he's like what a bath uh, I was like, yeah, because he had no idea what was going on. So he did that and he was like, okay. So then he did that and I jumped in the bath and uh, he went and got all the candles. And there's no wind, there were no windows in that bathroom. So it's really dark, four candles, got my water, coconut water, and I had made labor aid and he put it out of reach, <laughs> which was annoying. <laughs> so, but I got the water and the coconut water anyway. And I was in the bath and I was on my knees and hanging on the, the tap. And in my head, I, from Isla's birth, I had this, you need to empty your bladder because there's no one going to stick a catheter in you here. I had that in my head the whole time. I thought, well, I'll, I'll let me just lie down first in the bath. Nope, nope, can't do that. <laughs> and turn around and I was hanging on the, uh, we hang our clothes or hung our clothes. And then I thought, right, I'm going to get up and have a, a wee. And then I, as I was on the, the loo, two two pushes was it like my body just like totally took over again one push two pushes and I'm sitting there thinking what what this is this has gone too fast this is not happening mm. I'm not gonna feel because I'll just be disappointed and now I'm gonna have a feel and then I felt I was like there's a head a head <laughs> so I'm like oh, I'm trying to get off the toilet and I can't, I literally can't get up because the head's right there. And so I'm like, babe, the, I think the baby's coming. So he like jumps out of bed, comes in, lifts me up, helps me up from the toilet. And then one more push and the head's out. I held her head. And then this was the coolest part watching it rotate watching the head rotate that was so cool looking down and then the next one whoosh, the body and he grabbed her body and then we lifted her up together on my chest 
and then he runs out. He's like gone. I'm like, where did he go? I've just given birth to a baby. <laughs> he comes back in. He's like, eleven forty-six p.m. Because <laughs> I was like, very. I had told him several times, you need to keep an eye on the time. I want to know exactly when it was. <laughs> so he had that in his head. And I drummed Cute. that into his head. Um, and then two minutes later, Mum comes. It. She's like. This a, this, somebody's crying. She thought it was Isla. I said, she's, why is she crying like a baby? Uh, she, the baby's the baby. So she came in and she thought, wow. And she is still in awe today about this amazing experience. Aww. She's like, do you remember? <laughs> like, yeah, Aww, that's I remember. so sweet. That's so yeah. cool she was there. Yeah, I know. She stayed the night. Um, so then I jumped back in the bath and... And I was like, get Isla, because I wanted her to be there. I want her to know that this is normal. (laughs) This is the normal way of giving birth. Like, that she can do it this way. She will do it this way. (laughs) But, you know, she was asleep. So she came in and she was like, what What is it? And I hadn't really even bothered to check. I was like counting fingers and toes and just like, oh, loving her and my husband had asked what oh what is it and I was like oh maybe I'll have a look <laughs> so I asked Isla what do you think it is and she says it's a girl I said yes a girl <laughs> she said I Aww. knew it and then we took some pictures it was still so dark I still had the four candles so like the pictures are really really grainy and dark but I love them anyway and I did have my friend lined up to come and take pictures but a, it wouldn't have been the same experience if she had been there, if I had been watched. And, and also, uh, I, I, I didn't have time to phone her. I, okay. I wouldn't know. I was co- and, oh, yeah, the, this is um, what I'm wondering. Because I didn't ever feel like I was in that zone. But I wonder if that's because I was never undisturbed from that zone with the free birth. Mm -hmm. Because I remember always being pulled out of it in my Mm -hmm. first. Mm -hmm. I started to feel like the placenta was ready to come. Isla had asked if she could go back to bed now. I'm tired. Can I go back to bed? She's like, I get it. It's cool. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah, whatever. We got to get to the point where birth is so normal. Yeah. We don't even wake our kids up. Yeah. (laughs) You know what I mean? (laughs) Where it's like. It doesn't even matter because it's so integrated, right? Yeah, <laughs> definitely. Absolutely. Totally. <laughs> so then I birthed the placenta. No problems. I wasn't sure whether I wanted to do um, Lotus because I'm quite an impatient person and I didn't think I would have the patience to do that. Um, her, knowing when the, um, the, um, the uh, cord actually came off in the end, I could have done Lotus, but uh, we kept it attached for 17 hours. So after the birth, we hung out on the sofa for a bit and chatted and like just, oh, she, we were skin to skin. Uh, we were both naked. I had um, a dressing gown like around me and towels and blankets and, but we were skin to skin. And then I fell asleep and mom, she was my postpartum birth keeper. <laughs> she went she was washing the placenta like making sure everything was okay and like because she was attached to the placenta she couldn't take the placenta away she had to bring a bowl and she was washing it and she did all that for me and yeah it was so amazing to have her there to do Mm -hmm. that and uh, and then I woke up and I found that she had like set up camp next to me on the sofa she'd fallen asleep and I was like so cute she helped me get up for a wee and uh and then at four in the morning I woke up and was covered in meconium (laughs) (laughs) so I had to wake her up again (laughs) and that stuff doesn't come off (laughs) like now I know how to do it someone told me you know use um oil Mm -hmm. but now I didn't know that so I was scrubbing that off (laughs) yeah and so we did the um the cord burning ceremony 17 hours later um, and it was just <laughs> it was so beautiful we had music playing and candles mm. and yeah Sorry, so who are, who are you now after this 
epic. I'm a radical birth keeper, Emily. (laughs) (laughs) Like, who are you as a as a woman now, as a mother, and yeah, as a radical birth keeper? So, I set up my postpartum. I had a proper village around me, um, people doing things for me, food. Da 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 da. I feel like uh, I am a confident person anyway but I think in mothering and birthing women can kind of second guess themselves and here it was like bam 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 I know exactly what I'm doing this is what I want my relationship with Riley has changed my relationship with Isla yeah definitely so it's completely changed me as a mom as a woman yeah and both of their births inspired me to become a radical birth keeper and take the radical birth keeper school uh, to support other women, like birth yeah. time, second time, whatever. I, I'm there for you. <laughs> and how can, if there's women in Sweden listening to this, how can women find you locally? Turtle goddess birth. Um, this is my email, turtlegoddessbirth at protonmail.com and i'm Ted goddess birth on instagram yeah awesome i'll just end with so many years ago many many years ago my mum bought me a card and it says things work out best for the people who make the best out the way things work out and that is me and that you know that's island's birth yeah it could have gone differently but it was for me totally yeah uh, that's why I went on to free birth and that's why I went on to become a radical birth keeper. Yeah. And um, you know, just the work meeting women and I did a, a birth trauma debrief and you know, just the gratitude from just uh, from listening to a story. Just amazing. Mm. Beautiful. <laughs> thank you so much thank you simple Always. and sweet I love it I know it is and but I still think it's because uh, I was like well you know my story is just a bit yeah simple but, but most of most of the free birth stories are like that but that's the yes, point is to let exactly. women know it doesn't need to be some like big dramatic exactly thing totally. yes uh, yeah because I was like well I didn't have a, a traumatic story but it's still even though I was happy with my birth story at the time, then I started unpacking it. And that's, that, cause yeah, that is, uh, that's why I'm here. And um, it's always a pleasure speaking to you, Emily. Yeah, thank you for your time. <laughs> thank you. And that's it for today, my sisters. Check out everything we do, including one-on-one and group coaching. Learn about our private membership, in-person retreats, and more on freebirthsociety.com. Our online courses are on freebirthsocietycourses.com, including our flagship course, The Complete Guide to Free Birth. Don't miss the Radical Birthkeeper School if you're ready to become the authentic midwife that women are searching for. Together we rise. And the revolution starts inside each of us. I'll leave you with our Free Birth Society theme song, Wild Woman by Aruba Red. I honor you for the wisdom you held, the ancient traditions of plant medicine and womb magic. I feel the spirit of the ancestors as I place my hands upon my belly. This sacred portal will be honoured. Eons upon light beams of survival withstanding the eradication of our power by design. I will not allow the separation of our young to be forced upon me. My sisters will no longer birth in captivity. The picket line redefined from burning our wild women to paralysing us and drugging our babes. Strapped down in a clinical white bed, drying up the milk from our breasts. Keep your needles. My family will never again be doomed to chase those dragons or your poison. We reject your fear. We choose love. Everything with intention. Death, ascension. I will fly and bring her back from the start. Conscious.